long overdue 2020 Olympics kicked off on Wednesday, July 21, when Australia was resoundingly thumped by their Japanese hosts on a softball diamond in Fukushima. And with no spectators allowed into the venue, there was nothing more than a pre-recorded chant of Aussie, 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 oi, 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 to create atmosphere. These Olympics come after months of anything but softball from the IOC, which has forged ahead despite repeated outbreaks of COVID-19 globally and in the host city, Tokyo. Today, on the first episode in a three-part mini-series about the Games, the Michelson Alexander team will be looking at Tokyo 2020 through a strategic communications lens. I'm Jack Bannister, Michelson Alexander's lead copywriter, and with me is Senior Associate Shannon Gill. Shannon, welcome. Hello, Jack. Good to be chatting about uh, something that's really captured our imagination in the last week, and um, also good to be at Michelson Alexander. I uh, started a few months ago, and... Um, Enjoying it so far, and, and I think it's going to be really interesting to chat through these things with that comms lens that we can provide. Yeah, so the, the idea of the podcast is to talk about all things strategic communications using current events. And obviously, right now, there is no bigger event on than the Olympics. It's an absolute smorgasbord, really, of stakeholder engagement, of sponsorship, of marketing, of promotional material, of PR, all the things that we like to talk about and think about. Now, you've had a lot of experience prior to joining our firm working in sports communications. So a week ago, before the games kicked off, before the opening ceremony, what media narratives were you seeing and why are they so different to the narratives that we're reading about a week into the games? Yeah, and while while we're talking about sport, I think this can apply to any any industry in a in a way and pre olympics we were bombarded with with messages about whether these games should go ahead and that i think that kind of plays into what we're going through with covid at the moment and in a lot of ways there's an envy around about whether the things that we can't do and the things that other people can do Um, And it's human nature to to look at these things and say, well, I can't visit my sick relative overseas. And hang on, these athletes are going overseas and doing the thing that they love. So there's, I think that's that's the starting point for what of what was a lot of the negative publicity around whether these games should go ahead. But as you said, I I think with sport, and but it also applies to other things. When the story, the human story, comes through, uh, that can trump everything that comes comes before it. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go along. Yeah, I mean, the challenge for the IOC was a huge one because obviously these games are still being called Tokyo 2020, but in case you missed it, it is now 2021. Uh, so the stat that kind of has been used in the media frequently is that in May, 83% of the Japanese population didn't want the Olympics to proceed. And that dominated the headlines. So a week out from the games, we had you know headlines in the age saying that the Olympics could potentially turn into a global horror story. So if I make you wear a bit of a strategic communications hat and kind of almost pretend you're working for the IOC for a minute, what would you have done to try and negate some of that really negative media? It can be in a, a difficult situation across its, across its life, the IOC, because for four years, they are old men in suits that have a a reputation as being this bureaucratic and perhaps sometimes non-transparent organisation. And then every four years, there's two weeks where there is this great celebration of not people in suits, it's of young athletes from all parts of the world, and there's so many good stories that that happen as part of it. So this is the challenge, is what do you do in the the between times? So the the problem the IOC had is that while this global pandemic – washes over everyone around uh, around the world and, and no one's been untouched is that how do you co- try and remind people that there is there is two weeks of joy that you can enjoy still uh, and do it in a way where you, your main stakeholder being Tokyo and the people of Tokyo who would love to be there and watching this are not allowed to go and watch it. So already they feel they're missing out. So there is that envy that we don't get to see this like we would have been able to see this. So it would be interesting to dig, dig deeper into what that survey said and who did that survey. But th- th- those 80, 83% of the, of the Japanese population, did they not want the Olympics to proceed because they would like it to proceed next year when they can go? Because I can totally understand that answer. Or are they actually worried about 
their own health in this situation. Now, it's totally reasonable for people to believe that they're worried about their own health in that situation. However, I think what the ISC and what you've got to look for, for if, if you're in the ISC's shoes is that there's been precedents throughout the world over the last 12 to 18 months of sport being safe. Most major sporting leagues have run modified or non-spectator events which have not resulted in great health outbreaks for the general public. They've run bubbles that have been effective um, and generally the only people that have that have got got COVID through this have been the athletes themselves and that's not that's not a great result but what it does do is it sort of protects you from that this could negatively affect people outside outside of the olympics i think what the isc have done and and whether this has stepped up because of this is is could be debated but certainly in the lead up they've they've had a focus on the good things that they're doing. What are the communities-based kind of initiatives that they can push? So things like, you know, the refugee team is a great example of something that the ISC can do that that plays into a always one approach. And it plays into the fact that we are the, the whole we're all in this together line that gets trotted out about COVID so so often. But it does play into this. But even things like they push the story of the cardboard beds which I think is a really interesting one, is one that oh, at one level, oh, what a great environmentally friendly thing that, that the ISC are doing. Oh, that's a tick to the ISC. They're doing something good. The other thing it does is it actually, it actually tells the world that these athletes are not going into five-star accommodation. I, I like that because it was this double two-pronged attack on that that, that that said, one, we're doing something really good for the environment, but hey, just a reminder these athletes are not going into luxury. These are not pampered athletes. Um, they are not experiencing things that you are not being able to experience. Hey, you've got a bed at home. So, you know, this is better than the cardboard bed. So it's sort of, it made the point that there are sacrifices being made by these athletes. And I think it then, that kind of sets the stage for what happens next when the games actually start. Part of that, and I don't know whether this was a direct a directive from the IOC, but so many of the athletes are doing a you know, Instagram content touring the village and showing the spit test that they have to do every morning and how that process works. And then obviously playing into some of that um, media palaver around the beds, which kind of just manages to do a bit of distracting. The interesting thing for Japan is you're looking at, you know, economic losses in the billions, but an, an organization that essentially, you know, the way the Olympic contracts are drawn up when you are the host city, you basically surrender the ability to pull out of hosting those games. Now, no one could have predicted a, a global pandemic. What is probably more interesting than the initial stat that I mentioned is that a more recent poll by Kyoto News Agency found that 80% of respondents were worried the games would cause a surge in COVID infections, but 71% conceded they were still looking forward to watching them, which I think is a bit of a global feeling because everyone's kind of clutching for the good news story and wants to be kind of, we're almost ready, I think sometimes as a public here to be, okay, yeah, there's a risk involved with this, but if we don't do this, what are we going to have to to look forward to? And I think that's part of once the games have begun and you've had so many great stories emerging from an athletic perspective, they've basically been able to to hammer home that point. Even the the commentary out of Tokyo is that the whole thing of staying at home and watching and and, and that would be demoralising if if you're if you're someone even if you're not a sports minded person and, and you've been looking forward to this thing for for a decade. Um, imagine put yourself in the shoes of if you can think back that long or if you're young if you're old enough the Sydney Olympics. Imagine you think of the almost a decade or seven years of absolute fervour around how excited we were to have the Sydney Olympics. And if that was taken away from you, that would be a very difficult thing to deal with. And it would be very, I can see the negative the negative approach. But as you said before, um, Jack, the problem is once it gets to that, at that certain point, it becomes a financial game. And putting yourself again into the IOC's shoes, what is the IOC's purpose of being? It's actually of, of pushing forward the Olympic movement. So... As much as health concerns can override this, that is their number one, as an organisation, is their number one priority. So how can they do this in a safe way? The general public will, ne will never understand everything that goes into making this safe. But as you said, there, there are ways you can push it. You can push the stories about getting tested every day. You can push the stories about, about the you know, the, the strict protocols around getting in and out, cutting down the amount of journalists that go over there and, and then the quarantine they go in when they get there. So there's there's a lot of things present to tell you that this is not a normal Olympic Games and we are doing it in a way 
that is best for the bigger picture of safety of Japan and the global village here. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting time in history for the Olympic movement anyway because they have obviously had major problems in the last, you know, particularly particularly last decade around Russian doping and I guess looking at an integrity issue. And then there's been kind of this ongoing question in, in world sport of where the Olympic movement fits in. So this was probably, you know, not delivering this games was potentially terminal for the movement. Um, and what they've proven by actually being able to do it, and there have been some hiccups and, for example, Toyota pulled out of doing games commercials on TV in Japan. So there was a sponsorship hit of delivering the games, but actually having a missed games completely. I think people would have almost forgotten a little bit about what the Olympics can deliver. And in the Australian context, it's interesting you mentioned Sydney because obviously delivering Brisbane in 2032 and Australia to this point having had a very successful games – I think we'll really revitalize the Olympics here in a way that we probably haven't seen since we had the, the post-Sydney momentum that carried us through uh, Athens and Beijing, but then probably died by London and Rio. And this hopefully now, this yeah. little kick and these gold medals that we're winning will create a buzz here again. And that's, again, probably what the IOC is hoping for, for multiple nations. You know, France that's hosting the Olympics soon is probably in a very similar boat. I think... Your your point about where does the Olympics fit in the bigger the bigger picture of world sport is is a really interesting one, um, and, and my take on it is that, and this and this comes down to again how, and it doesn't mean to be it doesn't have to be sport. It's it's how a story is told and what what level of exposure a, a, a story gets when you're we're trying to when you're trying to communicate something positive. Let's go back to twenty years ago in Sydney, for example. At that point, there was no such thing as social media. At that point. There were some homes that didn't have the internet. There's a lot. There's a. It's a different time, and it certainly means that pre two thousand, and even if for Australia, cable TV was not had not taken hold in any great way, great shape or form. So, you, the Olympics at that point was a two week extravaganza for sporting heads, where you had basically twenty four seven sport on on television, and that was such a novelty. I think that whether you were really into into Olympic sports or not. The sheer fact that you you could turn on the TV at any time of day and watch sport was this incredibly important thing and special thing, and people gravitated towards it. Obviously, since then things the world's changed a hell of a lot, and you can turn on television at any time of any day and watch sport. You can turn your phone on at any time of any day and watch live sport. So, does the Olympics have a, a strong enough value in this time to actually stand apart from what is a, a 24-7, 365 day a year, every year, extravaganza of a sport that happens anyway. So so I think these things are really important and and you're right. It, it may have been terminal for it. I think the upside of what has happened and, and you know making the best of a bad situation is that, and I'll talk about it in an Australian context, first of all, getting the Brisbane Olympics is, is a huge thing and, and gives us something to look forward to. The second part is that we are sitting here, a lot of us in lockdown, and we can maybe afford the luxury of having a TV on in the background while we work or not work. Um, we've got schools that haven't have only just gone back to you know going back or in Sydney not not uh, in school at all at the moment. So you've got kids that can can watch it and engage in a way that they may not have done normally, and it's actually in our time zone hours as well. I mean, a lot of some Olympics get, get played in an hour where we wake up and watch a replay and go, oh, great, and then off to work we go. So we're actually experiencing it in real time. And that is probably to a degree is happening globally, to a degree, as in there's a lot of, lot of people that are now working from home across the globe. There's our, our, the, the, the complete way we've, we're, we're spending our day-to-day has changed over the last 18 months. So all of a sudden, we are now experiencing this thing together again, like we did way back in the day, before 2000. We we're experiencing it in a way that where we can connect on it. And I think that is really important the way this first week of the Olympics has played out. And it's interesting that you mentioned Sydney because the storytelling component of the IOC's comm strategy has changed so much since Sydney. And what's really kind of interesting for them is I think probably in an earlier era or in earlier eras, they probably would have had to go to market a bit more and take stories to the media and rely on the media as a vessel. What you see now is a lot of the predominant 
stories that come out of these games come through social media and they're often actually produced on social media by the athletes. So Simone Biles is a really great example. She's pulled out of team events in the gymnastics because of her mental health. She's an absolute international superstar, but she's able to go out front foot through social media to connect with millions of fans and tell the story of what's happening to her, what she's experiencing at these games completely in her own words. There's no middleman. The IOC actually doesn't have to do anything. They've kind of got the perfect like communications landscape because all they really have to do is let the amazing athletes do their thing. And we've seen that again with Ariane Titmus going head to head with Katie Ledecky, which is a once in a lifetime swimming matchup. They've kind of just got to sit back, let Dean Boxall celebrate like mad and it will go viral. So from their point of view, actually flipping that narrative isn't necessarily that difficult once the athletes start doing the things, right? Once they start doing the sports ball, it gets really easy. And I think this is a great example that, that can be applied to comms well beyond sport and the Olympics is that if you tell good stories, if you tell human stories that people connect with, the general public won't be as interested in the bad stories that might be out there because we, we are all – enthralled with watching Titmus win gold medals, watching uh, other swimmers do well, watching the rowers win gold medals. That's what we want to know about right now. And again, re- referring it to how general comms work. You can have a number of bad stories or a number of potential negative bad stories that swirl around your business. But if you're doing something in a business, there must be a good story to tell. If you haven't got a good story, then you've got to, you, you got to sit back and go, is this something we should be doing? But if you've got a good story to tell, you need to tell that story. And, and I, I know in the past I've worked with organisations that um, have historically had bad publicity. And the idea of going out and, and proactively trying to do something good and talking about something good they're doing, they shy away from because they've been burnt before. But if you can go out and tell a good story, at worst, it reduces your negative perception by a percentage. At best, it actually completely reconfigures the paradigm you're working in. So, and I think this is a great example. Up until the opening ceremony, all the talk was on the potential negatives or, or the should this Olympic Games be going ahead. And even if you look at swimming, a month ago, a huge negative story about treatment of female swimmers. I suppose what I call it, alleged misogyny of male swimming coaches and that male swimming coaches dominated the sport. Three days or four days into the Olympics, I haven't heard one word <laughs> about <laughs> about that story. Now, that's not a knock on the media or a knock on, on anyone else. What it tells you is that if we can connect with the story, like we can connect with the fact that Ariane Titmus's family moved from Tasmania to Queensland to progress her career, like we can, we can all identify with the fact that Kelly McEwen's father passed away and didn't get to watch her race and she wins the gold medal now. These are all stories that we have a very human connection with. And I think it's a lesson again to say, as organisations, we may get in very difficult waters and technical waters that are negative. And it does scare the hell out of people from actually going and speaking about things. If we can flip the script and tell a human story, simplify it as much as possible and make sure the public can be in the shoes of that person, tell a human story about why this is happening and why we are doing this, all of a sudden you can change the narrative completely. And I think that's a a great example of this week is that we are not talking about negative things. We're all sitting around, even if we're non-sports people, waiting to see what's the next thing that's going to happen in these Olympics. I think to wrap up, it might be worth uh, just some reflection from you and myself on what we're kind of looking for is the next steps. So I I think the most interesting thing from here for me is uh, how the Japanese public react to these games after they're over. I know Japan at last last time I looked was leading the medal tally. I think they had eight or nine gold medals. Um, They're flying. Um, It'll then also spiral into what happens with COVID in Japan post the Olympics? Because we're currently getting a thousand cases a day in Tokyo. So does that drop off? Does the Olympics spike that? And then, you know, from a Stratcom's perspective, how will the IOC deal with those narratives as they emerge? So before I get you to throw to episode two, I might just get a closing watch this space from you, Shannon. There's always going to be a a dip after we go, well, was that worth it? In a lot of ways, rightly or wrongly, I suppose, minimized or, or shaped by the fact of what were the stories that were told during, during those Olympics for Japanese athletes or the Japanese public that they identified with? And does that thing that they hold on to cancel out 
the, the supposed negatives. And again, I'll go back to Sydney here. There was a lot of discussion post Sydney about whether, you know, was that worth it? Are we going to be paying off this financially for a long time? There, there was discussion about that. But going forward, what do we remember about Sydney? Remember, we remember Kathy Freeman. We remember Ian Thorpe. We rem- so, so there's this there's this legacy, and and again, I'll, I'll put myself in the IOC shoes. Is that whether we like it or not, at the end of the day, they're there to, to further the Olympic movement and sport. The caravan packs up and moves on to the next the next uh, the next city. So there, there's an element of that that in no way do you want this to turn into a disaster afterwards. But if there's a, enough good stories that come out of this, I think they can push that and be safe, as opposed to it being some sort of disaster. And it'll be interesting to see what the media appetite is after lots and lots of positive stories to potentially be looking quite in depth at a potentially really negative story. So I think that for me will be another, you know, interesting byproduct of the post games wash up. Jack, it's been good to chat about all of this stuff. And I think this plays really well into our next episode um, where we're actually going to talk to someone who was there, who has been there on the ground in Tokyo and give us a really insight into what it was like or what it has been like what worked and whether whether our theories on the way things have been um, pushed of, has has a, a ring of truth to it. So in our second episode about the games, we're going to be joined by Rowing Australia's uh, head of comms, Lucy Benjamin, and she's in the middle of it right now and dealing with the day-to-day, seeing athletes win gold medals. So she's got those great human stories to tell. Um, but she's also going to talk to us about what a cancellation of the Olympics would have meant, you know, does for all of these sports that are in the Olympics, it is for a lot of them their moment in the sun every four years. So, what does it mean? Does that does that actually harm the sport if the Olympics were cancelled? What does it mean to have no crowd around? It'll be a really interesting chat about to answer some of those things that we've put forward, but also take us into the village and understand how those the things are being communicated or not communicated to uh, ensure that the the IOC brand um, comes through this with a halo over its head. But in the meantime, if you've enjoyed the show, and it is our first one, but please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And you can head to LinkedIn and and Twitter to follow Michelson Alexander. And if you're interested in strategic communication advice for your business, the Michelson Alexander team is around to help. So just head to our website, www.michelsonalexander.com.au. Get in touch with us and we can talk to you about your needs. We'll see you on the next episode, Jack. Great to be with you, Shannon. Cheers. Cheers.